Welcome to chapter 32, where we look at some applications of nuclear physics. So one of the things that most of you are familiar with is that um, uh, certain types of nuclear reactions can be used for imaging and diagnostics by the medical field. So gamma radiation can easily penetrate human tissue and it makes it very useful in medicine. Um, we can take compounds and replace a non-radioactive nuclide with a radioactive one. This is called, we say that we've tagged it. <clears throat> and the idea is that as this now radioactive nuclide passes through the body, you can track its progress. It's, it's a, a very ingenious technique. There are lots of compounds we can do this with. They're called radiopharmaceuticals and they're very, very useful for imaging. I myself have had radioactive iodine when they were diagnosing some thyroid issues because iodine concentrates in the thyroid. And uh, they were able to, to tell that I didn't have a cancer. So some of the diagnostic uses for these radiopharmaceuticals are listed uh, in table 32.1 in the textbook. I'm going to scan down and I hope, whoops, I overshot, didn't I? So you can see for brain scans, they use technetium and others. For PET scans, you can use carbon or nitrogen or oxygen. For a lung scan, there's technetium again um, and other assorted isotopes. I'm sure you can investigate if you are curious, but there's a long list of them. Right. So approximately 80% of all radiopharmaceutical procedures use technetium. What's really neat about this is it produces a single easily identifiable gamma ray, and that means you won't confuse it with anything else. Um, it also has a very short half-life, only approximately six hours. This is really important because when you introduce something that's radioactive into the human body, you don't want it to be there for very long. So that short half-life means it can come in, do its job, and then be gone. Uh, another thing that's good about technetium is that you can produce it easily on site, uh, and it'll attach to lots of different compounds that'll allow imaging. There are other techniques. Um, you, you can do single photon emission tomography or PET scans. Um, they're particularly useful for diagnosing brain disorders. This is a, an ever evolving field. Things are changing as we learn more and more. And the goal is always to use the least amount of radioactive material as possible to get the best images for diagnostic techniques. Let's look at some of the biological effects of ionizing radiation. So radiation loses energy as it passes through matter by two processes. It can ionize. Remember that when something undergoes ionization, it means you've stripped off an electron uh, or it can also excite the molecules. So in, in either process, either by stripping off electrons or by adding extra energy to the molecules in the material, it changes them. The degree and the type of damage that's done depends on the type and the energy of the radiation. And it also depends on properties of the material. So if radiation passes through the cornea, it's going to do one type of damage. If it passes through a bone, it's going to do a different type of damage or through liver cells, you'll get a different type of damage. Um, maybe we'll get out of the human body and, and see what happens to the radiation if it passes through metal. Well, typically with metal, uh, the damage is done by uh, neutrons in the form of atomic displacement. And what this ends up doing is it producing metal fatigue 
and the uh, any item made out of metal then has a, the likelihood of becoming brittle and failing in time. In a biological organism, the damage is due primarily to ionization effects inside the cells. And what these ion effects, ionization effects do is they disrupt the normal operation of the cells, they produce chemical reactions in the cells, or even kill the cells. So things are, are never left undisturbed when the radiation passes through. We've got two ways that radiation damage shows up. It'll show up either as somatic damage or as genetic damage. So genetic damage is damage to the egg and the sperm cells, and somatic damage is damage to everything else. Anything that's not a reproductive cell, if it gets damaged, that's somatic damage. We are um, fortunate that as human beings, we've been exposed to radiation and evolved with it in the atmosphere around us. Uh, the earth gets bombarded with cosmic radiation on a daily basis. Uh, depending on where you live, there's a little bit of exposure to radiation. And so we have adapted to our environment in one way or another. Uh, scientists were really concerned before the bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki back uh, ending World War II that exposure to radiation would produce genetic damage, and this was not the case. Now, the bombs did produce horrific damage. Anyone who was, was exposed to radiation at the time certainly became ill or died or had, had uh, terrible burns on their bodies, and it was an awful thing. But we didn't have generations of children being born from survivors with some sort of genetic mutation. And so there was a benefit, I suppose. So radiation preferentially attacks rapidly reproducing cells. What that means is that the faster the cells are reproducing, the more likely the radiation is to preferentially pick it to attack. So in adults, these are in the, the bone marrow and the lymph tissue. Um, one reason we don't traditionally expose pregnant women to uh, radiation if we can help it is because a fetus is a rapidly growing, reproducing collection of cells and it would be, um, we, we feel harmed extensively by exposure to radiation. We don't typically expose young children to radiation if we can help it. We've learned a lot about this and the risk and we avoid it whenever possible. However, one of the benefits is that cancer cells are also rapidly reproducing. And so if they've been exposed to ionizing radiation, the radiation will target these cancer cells and you can use it to kill them off. Um, or at least slow their progress. So it has its benefits. We measure radiation in different ways. Um, basically, we've got four interrelated units for measuring radioactivity, exposure, absorbed dose, and dose equivalent. So we're measuring these four different things radioactivity, exposure, absorbed dose, and dose equivalent. And we, so they're related, but they're different. So radioactivity refers to the amount of ionizing radiation that's released by the material. Initially, this was measured in units of the Curie, named after Pierre and Marie Curie. And more recently, we changed it to a more modern term, the Becquerel. In the very next section, section, I'll give you specifics of how these two are different from each other. Um, so if we look at exposure, that describes the amount of radiation traveling through the air. So it's traveling through the air. Radioactivity is what's being released by the material. Exposure is what gets 
detect what travels through the air. So radiation monitors measure exposure. Typically, we'd use the units of the Rencon, or if we wanted to do MKS units, it would be the Coulomb per kilogram. Uh, and then we can look at absorbed dose. So again, radioactivity is what the material gives off. Exposure is what passes through the air. Absorbed dose describes the amount of radiation absorbed by an object or a person. So it's the amount of energy that the radioactive sources deposit in materials they pass through. And we have doses of rads and gray that are used to measure those. And then finally, we have dose equivalent or sometimes called the effective dose. And what this does is it looks like, it looks at the combination of the amount of radiation absorbed and the medical effects of that type of radiation. Um, and it is useful because it can, um, compare different kinds of radioactive materials. Um, so the units for that are the Rincon equivalent MAN, which is always abbreviated as the REM or the Sievert. Um, all right, let's move along. Whoops, I went too fast, didn't I? So curies give us the radioactivity of a substance while a measurement in rims or millirims gives the amount of energy that your radioactive source deposits in living tissue. Now, as an example, uh, this is from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, a branch of the US government. If a person received a dose equivalent of one millirim, it would be what you would typically get in any one of these. So three days of living in Atlanta, Georgia would give you one millirim. Two days in Denver, Colorado would give you one millirim. That means Denver is more dangerous than Atlanta for exposure to radioactivity. Uh, a year of watching TV on average would give you a millirim. I'm not sure that's accurate anymore more and more TVs don't give off very much radiation. A year of wearing a watch with a luminous dial, well, again, that's not very common. Uh, a year of coast-to-coast -coast airline flight, well, that's still an issue because if you go up in a plane, you're exposed to more cosmic radiation. A year living next door to a normally operating nuclear power plant it really doesn't give you very much. You see, you live next door to that power plant for a whole year, and it's about the same as living three days in Atlanta. So I said earlier that I would differentiate between the Curie and the Becquerel. So we'll do it right here. So the Curie is 37 billion disintegrations per second. So it's an activity of 37 billion disintegrations per second. It seems like such a strange number. Well, it was re originally defined as the activity of one gram of radium-226. And that was before we could count it very accurately. Uh, you have to have some place to start from. So 37 billion disintegrations per second. That is obviously not an MKS unit. So to make it a little more modern and to keep up with our, our units, a more modern unit is the Becquerel. A Becquerel is just one disintegration per second. We use both of these in physics quite extensively. The Rincon uh, is the amount of ionizing radiation that produces 0.333 times 10 to the minus nine coulombs of electric charge in one cubic centimeter of air. The RAD, the rate, which is short for the radiation absorbed dose, is the amount of radiation that deposits 10 to the minus two joules of energy into one kilogram of absorbing material. The RBE, which is short for relative biological effectiveness, is the number of RAD of X or gamma radiation 
that produces the same biological damage as one rad of the radiation being studied. So that X and gamma radiation are our sort of standards, our benchmark, if you will. And scroll down and get some more of these to come up. So the RBE, the relative biological effectiveness, we just mentioned. The REM, the REM, the RAD equivalent man is an effective dose. Uh, the gray is the SI unit for absorbed dose and the sievert is the SI unit for effective dose. So let's look at some of those doses now that you've seen every unit you could possibly run into. So remember somatic effects are effects to anything that's not a reproductive organ. And this right hand column is the acute whole body dose in Rinkin. So what does that mean? The acute whole body dose would be if you got that dose all at once over your entire body. We didn't target one part of the body. We didn't target the eyes or the hand or the heart or something of that nature. So if you get between six, fifth, zero and 50 Rinkin, you probably couldn't tell you'd been exposed. If you get between 50 and 100, if we looked at your blood, there'd be some noticeable differences in the number of white blood cells. We'd be able to detect it there. If you go from 100 to 200, more than likely you would throw up and there'd be a definite shortage of white blood cells. In the 200 to 1000 range, you would be throwing up, you'd be very susceptible to infection, your hair would probably fall out, and you could very possibly die from this. If you get over a thousand, you're more than likely gonna have diarrhea, diarrhea, excuse me, fever, convulsions, and death. Uh, now we do expose people to doses over a thousand Rinkin, but it's not acute whole body. It's to target uh, tumor cells sometimes. And the whole idea is yes, to kill the tumor cell. So let's look at some of those medical procedures you may have had and see how they compare. I went too far, I do this, don't I? All right, so a single chest X-ray gives you two millirims. Dental X-rays, all four bite wings would be 0 0.4 millirims. They're getting better and better. If you had your arm X-rayed or a shoulder, it would be six millirims. If they were looking at your abdomen for some reason, it would be 70. If you had a mammogram, four images, it would be 13 millirims. If you're treating a tumor, it's 2,000 to 8,000 millirims. And again, they try really hard to target only the tissue they want to destroy and not to do damage to healthy tissue. All right, this little graphic, I want to shrink down to normal size just so we can see it all when we talk about it. So what we're looking here at sources of uh, radiation exposure, the green is what is called background radiation. Background radiation is radiation that occurs naturally in your surroundings. So it could be in the air you breathe. It could be in the walls that surround you. It could be in um, food you eat, I suppose. Uh, that, but these are normal everyday amounts. So cosmic rays, depending on where you live, or, or that would be space. Um, internal would be what you'd eat. Uh, terrestrial would be the ground that we walk on. Radon and thoron are radioactive gases. And then here on the other side, you will see medical sources. So, um, nuclear medicine and uh, interventional fluoroscopy and, and other things, so medical sources. And then right here, you can see that there's a little tiny bit for occupational, little tiny bit for industrial, little tiny bit for uh, consumer products of one sort or another. So let's get up bigger again and see where we are. I just wanted you to understand the graphic a little bit. 
So the average dose per person from all sources is about 360 millirem per year. Um, it's not uncommon to get more than that. If you do, it's probably because of medical procedures. Now, some people can go their whole lives and only get dental x-rays. And so your medical procedures are not very large. And then there are people that have issues. You break a lot of bones or you get sick and, and you need nuclear medicine to help and you're going to have a larger dose rate. International standards allow exposure to as much as 5,000 millirems a year for people who work with and around radioactive material. Um, the upper limit recommended by the US government is that 5,000 millirems, which is just five rem per year. As you saw from the previous pie chart, the largest single contributor is going to come from background radiation and then medical sources will come in a close second. So the medical sources will be right behind it. As I said earlier, background radiation is just that natural radiation found around us. It's everywhere. Um, cosmic rays come from deep space. The higher you get in altitude, the greater your exposure to cosmic rays. They come in through um, the polar, well, actually they, they penetrate through everything. So we won't get into that. Background radiation does vary from state to state and within a state from location to location. We worry about the long-term effects of radiation and its increased risk. Um, leukemia has been linked to exposure to radiation. Most non-smoking related cancers of lung, uh, I'm sorry, most non-smoking related cases of lung cancer are associated with radon gas exposure. And radon gas is just normally in the environment. It comes up through the ground. If you live in a house that has a crawl space or a basement, you ought to have it tested for radon gas if you live in North Carolina. Um, there are websites you can go to to see if your geographic area has an increased risk of radon gas exposure. They can even narrow it down by zip code, if I remember correctly. So the latency period between the onset of radiation-induced cancer and, the, and leukemia is about two years. It's about 15 years for most other forms. Um, some uses of radiation. Well, tracing. You can use radiation to trace the path that an isotope takes in a plant or an animal. Maybe you want to look at the uptake of nitrogen by plants. Well, if you make it a radioactive or you tag it, we've talked about that before, then you can watch it actively uptake the nitrogen. Um, and, and other things, I've already mentioned the radioactive <clears throat> excuse me, iodine that I had to take for my thyroid function. And there are lots of other things you can do. So it has a lot of uses in agriculture. Um, they can also use it in the automobile industry to look at uh, um, the wear and tear on a piston. Uh, you can use it in the, the absorption of fluorine in your teeth or the contamination of food processing equipment. Maybe you're worried that um, the meat grinder at the store is uh, contaminated. You can check this out by using tagged elements. Or maybe you're worried that the design is such that it would be easily contaminated. <clears throat> We also have something called activation analysis. So you can take a neutron and bombard a target with it, and that will turn the target into a radioactive isotope. 
And then you can look for the radiation given off by that isotope and just see where your sample is. So you can bombard samples with neutrons to create different isotopes. So in our example, copper 65 is being slammed by a neutron. It turns into copper 66, which gives off a beta minus and turns into zinc 66. So you can look at the radiation emitted and determine that uh, copper was present in your original sample. Maybe you don't know if the copper is there or not, so you just bombard everything with the neutrons. And then you look for this particular beta minus and the zinc. So a lot of industries use this neutron activation analysis. Um, they used it to determine that Napoleon probably died from arsenic poisoning. They can use it in airports and other places to screen for bombs. Um, lots of explosives contain nitrogen. And so it's, it's pretty easy to uh, bombard that with neutrons and see what you get. We can also control bacteria using nuclear materials. Um, gamma radiation is often used to kill bacteria on different products. You can use it to keep spices, potatoes, uh, fruits and vegetables, and even chicken fresh longer by killing the harmful bacteria. Uh, there's concern over irradiation foodstuffs. Um, most people, if you told them something had been uh, irradiated, they would worry that it was now radioactive and that they would become sick or radioactive themselves, and that is not the case. The gamma rays pass through the material and they usually keep on going, but along the way they can destroy the bacteria. Um, but there are groups that are very concerned about it. So let's stop with this. We'll pick up with nuclear reactions and transmutation of elements in the next video. I'll stop the share and stop the video.